talking to another Commodorean, this time from Commodore Japan. Hello, yes, Terakura. Nice Hi. to meet you. Hi. Nice to meet you too. So, um, the interesting thing about you is you are the designer of the Commodore 64 and even the, um, the Rig 20. Yeah, the, the yeah I started Rig 20 designing along with the Chuck and uh, Bill Seiler, and then uh, I was in Japan at that time. Then I was transferred to the US and uh, did all the 64 also. Yeah. But there's there's not much known about you. You didn't you didn't do a lot of interviews lately. No. So um, there is quite a knowledge gap about what happened. Um, for the C64 and Commodore in Japan. So maybe you can shed a bit of light into that. Um, because the, the only information I've got so far is from the interview that Warg had with Michael Tomczyk. So maybe yeah. I could add some stuff. Um, but please start with, with explaining how did you happen to, to become a, a computer engineer and how did you start at Commodore? Yeah, I was uh, I was in the U.S. going to school. Then I went back to Japan after I finished my school. Then um, uh, my father's company had a uh, relationship with a, a Commodore Kagera manufacturing. Then um, I was involved, uh, you know, manufacturing of the Kagera. Then I was called by Jack, you know, the checking for the quality and everything in the U.S. Then uh, uh, Jack asked me to join the company as a, in, in Tokyo office, uh, Commodore, Japan at that time. And uh, they had two divisions. One is the educational divisions where they saw the uh, cassette tapes along with the textbooks to teach uh, Japanese, uh, <laughs> English to Japanese people. Then uh, there were the other sections, just uh, sales of the uh, calculators, and uh, they needed some sales engineers. So I joined and I was helping a uh, marketing and sales people. And also I was a uh, uh, kind of supervising a manufacturing plant in Japan. And that's how I became a, uh, one of the members of the Commodore. Actually, I was hired by Jack Tramiel. Yeah, then um, after a few years, uh, coming out in Tokyo, then they decided to move to Osaka, and I was from Osaka, so I was glad that they did that. Then um, we moved to uh, Osaka, and uh, after that I was just doing all the manufacturing and um, supporting our engineers, or sales engineers. And that was it. Then one day, it, well, actually, yeah, then the before, yeah, yeah, everybody moved to Osaka. It, it was kind of a long time ago, so I don't remember too well. But then uh, uh, the general manager, original general manager of the uh, Commodore Japan was kind of, fired or pushed out and before that I left the Commodore because uh, I did not agree with that general manager so I just simply left and I had my uh, own company of designing and uh, an R&D. Then um, they decided to move back to Tokyo again. At that time Tony Tokai, probably uh, Tom Chek mentioned that Tony Tokai was hired as a general manager of the Commodore. So they, when they moved back to Tokyo, they decided to have a engineering uh, department also. And they called me up and said, well, would you like to come back as a uh, you know, head of the engineering in Tokyo? I said, and I said, sure, why not? And um, I, came, you know, I went back to the um, Commodore. Then I started designing some of the uh, peripherals and uh, other I.O. systems for the Commodore and I was also supporting uh, system engineers for the uh, PET 
that time they, they were totally out of the calculator business and was into the uh, pet business. So, and I was interested in computer a lot. So I thought that was a good opportunity for me to start my uh, new venture in uh, computers. That's how we started in the computer, and uh, also, yeah, I did study some in uh, school, but, you know, it was just programming and everything, and it wasn't much of the uh, designing or anything, so, uh, yeah, I pretty much picked everything up when I was working with Commodore. Then uh, one day, uh, Tokai, uh, Tony, said, you want to go to the U.S. and talk to Jack? I said, why? And I said, uh, Jack wanted to talk to us. I said, okay, fine. And then we went to U.S. Then that's when the Jack brought up the story about the Vic 20 and said he wanted to produce Vic 20 and the design Vic 20 in Japan rather than in the U.S. because he thought that Japan was the leading edge of the computer at that time. So I met Chuck Pedro and uh, Bill Seiler and we talked, 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 and then uh, I took the uh, prototype and um, basic idea back to Japan and I finished it up. That's how I designed Vic 20. Then after I finished Vic 20, they told me to uh, move to US to finish the uh, successor of Vic 20, which was C64. Then we worked, and I was in IMOS Technology in uh, Norristown, or you want to call it Valley Forge, in Pennsylvania, and worked with a. Uh, few other guys and finished the 64 and took it to Japan and produced in Japan and actually final design was done in Japan, all the you know, boards and uh, housings and everything else. So then again, Jack quit, so I quit also. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't go with Jack, I just had my own company consulting in the R&D. Oh, that's yeah. So, so actually, compared to other Commodoreans, you started with the engineering through the company. You found your passion to it through the company, actually. True, yeah. Actually, when I was out of uh, Commodore Japan and when they started PET, I did buy PET. It was expensive, but they gave me a discount, so I bought one. and. Uh, I was working on it, and actually I made a few peripherals and uh, some of the I.O. boards and uh, some uh, softwares also. And they did have a uh, engineering department called CBM, which is totally Japanese uh, operation. And uh, Mr. Takagi was the head of the uh, CBM, and uh, among with uh, few other engineers, which later they dissolved the company and they transferred most of the engineers to U.S., including a, um, a Fujiyama-san and uh, Aoji-san and Nishimura-san and Tokuda-san and all those uh, key engineers were transferred to U.S. and they were working in the Santa Clara office. So, uh, there were the you know more more of the calculator engineers, not a computer engineers, and the only uh, engineers who had a good knowledge in the computer field was Mr. Fujiyama. Yeah, and I was working for Fujiyama-san, and he taught me a lot. Yeah. I see. So this is kind of interesting that um, the most successful computers from Commodore were actually designed and, well designed in Japan. Uh, is this related to, to the quote from Jack Tremel, um, where he once said, um, well, we have to become the Japanese? Is that yeah, the, uh, yeah, the uh, word actually I heard from Jack was like say, if we want to be number one in a computer, we have to be number one in Japan. So he said that he wanted to start in Japan and want, wanted to be number one in Japan, so in turn he would be number one in the world, including U.S. So he did start you know, selling the VIC-20 as a VIC-1001 1001 in Japan before they did any sales in the U.S. And uh, we did very good in Japan, so Jack decided, yes, if we can sell 
uh, this much computer in Japan, then we should be able to sell more in the U.S. So he took it to the U.S. and uh, we did uh, make a few modifications and, uh, and you know, it, it was pretty successful at that time, yeah. Yes, at, at least um, the Z64 is still, well, the most sold single computer of, of all of our time so far. With yeah, the, 35 million the, units. So I don't know how many millions, but uh, well, at that time, not many people were producing. That's only few models. And nowadays, you know, you got video models out, so it's very hard to sell big chunk of numbers in one model. You know? exactly. Yeah. So if if it was so important and so successful um, to to be in Japan for Commodore, why is there so less known about Commodore in Japan? And, um, well, I mean, shouldn't there be more known about this part of, of Commodore? I mean, everybody talks about U.S., Canada, and Europe, but Japan yeah, is only uh, very little. Well, when you look at it, even nowadays, Japanese are very, you know, the funny people. They are very, you know, the oriented in themselves. So their island, you know, so they think they have everything in their island. So even nowadays, if you look at the uh, cell phones, you know, Samsung, of course, iPhone took off in Japan, but before that, you know, Samsung, LG, everybody, but only cell phones sold in Japan was Sony, you know, Sharp, you know, Sanyo, all, all those Japanese cell phones. You know, the, the, the other the international cell phones never took off in Japan until iPhone. So it's the same thing when we started in the week 1001. Uh, they had a Apple and uh, they had a, of course there was NEC and a Panasonic. And NEC was number one. I think it was PC 8001 or something like that. Yeah. You know, then, then uh, I don't know why, but Japanese just went for the made in Japan and uh, made by the Japanese manufacturers and designed by Japanese manufacturers. And we did sell quite a bit in Japan, and because of the our price was so low and uh, it's very innovative designing, which kind of uh, left a user to you know create their own interface and make their own systems rather than just accept what it was you know so in that sense we are pretty successful uh, kind of catching few enthusiastic users which is more like a in Japan, it's called now is otaku you know is uh, more or less it's a you know the geek in Japan, and so those people jumped on uh, Vic 1001. Before that, they jumped on Kim One, which was a one board computer. In the same sense, they jumped on the Vic uh, 1001 to develop their own systems. But other than that, you know, most of the people wanted to just buy and use rather than just hustle with a, you know, making their own stuff. So The casual users, you would say. Yeah. I see. Um, but but um, you you did a different approach. You first released a modified Z64 version called the Max Machine, actually. Yeah, the I <laughs> to tell you honestly, I don't remember much about that Max because I think I whipped that one up in a couple of three days or something. So, and uh, of course that time I was in US and. Uh, did the first prototype stuff and just threw it to uh, Japan engineers, and um, it happened in Japan. And most of the things was finished in Japan. And uh, uh, what we do as an engineer, uh, the first thing is design the computers. Right after that, we go on to the next stage, which is the cost reduction stage. And uh, yeah, so once we you know finish and if it works, we don't care. We just you know do something new, which is cost reduction. So at that uh, process, I figured, hey, you know, if we can cut the cost down, 
to the bare minimum, we might be able to sell more. You know, so that was a Max machine. But that, uh, at that time, a lot of uh, other machines from Panasonic and everybody, they all came up. So, and uh, well, not necessarily in Japan, the cheap is the best, and uh, people did not go for that. Yeah. But nowadays, it's a rare machine. <laughs> yeah, this is, yeah. Um, so, so how, how did you, how did you go after it? I mean, and there's little known about it. The only thing I know from the Commodore in Japan is you had a different character set in it too, a Japanese character set. How did that work? I mean, the Commodore 64 was, was, only localized in Japan. Even in Germany, we didn't have German umlauts on our keyboards. Oh yeah, yeah. But in <laughs> yeah, we didn't have, have yeah. Japanese. Yeah, we have have a Japanese keyboard, and, um, and people loved it. And uh, we kind of inherited a lot of stuff from the pet days. We wanted to get a, a good uh, graphics. And uh, you know because they had a good capability of uh, good graphics, and also uh, even though Japanese people did not care much about the Japanese uh, keyboard because they it was very tedious type in you know, Japanese and not many people master that. So you know even nowadays they use a alphabet you know, just normal keyboard with a little bit of uh, addition. So. It's not much different from an American keyboard, but that time it was a little different, and of course the function keys and everything. But we didn't want to have a 200 you know key tops on the keyboard, so we just tried to make it maybe minimum. And also we had a Commodore keys to you know add more functions to the each keys, and that design was based on the big 1001, which was dedicated to Japan, you know, so, and uh, they actually did not go for the Japanese key tops, but they did go for the uh, Commodore function keys and all that uh, special keys. It was much easier and much easier to create the graphics because it wasn't a exactly a, a bitmap, you know, graphics. It was a more like character based graphics so yeah pet key I think it's the term yeah for that kind so of type of graphics so how how is it actually um if the keyboard are there like two versions like a Japanese keyboard that doesn't have the character sets on it next to the normal Latin letters and the second version that has the Japanese characters instead well uh, actually, the, on the key tops, we had a graphics and the Japanese both written on it, if I remember correctly. And you know, it was a it was a simple keyboard with a lot of characters on top of each key tops, and which we you know, utilized, and we could switch back and forth in between two character sets. That's that's how we coped with that problem, rather than having a humongous ASCII, you know, type of uh, uh, metrics. Yeah, well, it's interesting, as you, as you mentioned that, there are different um, types of the English keyboard from the Commodore 64. There are versions that have the, the pet key characters in front of the keys, and there are, are versions that have it on top. So, so why, why did you change that? I mean, was it even necessary to, to redesign the whole Commodore 64 a second version? Oh, um, actually, that uh, uh, redesigning of the uh, 64 was kind of done by so many different people because each country had each uh, demands and uh, you know wishes and stuff like that. And uh, the keyboard was made in Japan. All the keyboards were made by Mitsumi company, I believe. And uh, uh, I don't exactly remember how many keyboards and how many versions we had because of so many of the <laughs> different versions we had. 
and uh, like for European versions, everybody wanted to have a umrah with this and you know some weird characters, you know. <laughs> and the U.S. versions is very simple, and of course Japanese versions is different. And <clears throat> but uh, uh, it was all software keys anyway, so it was very easy to kind of have a different type of ROMs inside to accommodate all the keyboards and um, it was much easier for the users to have a special characters dedicated to their special use and for their country, yeah. So how does it feel for you to, to have created computers like, uh, well, the VIC-20 and the C64 that is now, now even a symbol for a generation that started home computing how, how does that feel for you? Do you think you are famous or responsible or somehow or humble? Well, the, I, at that time I never thought about, you know, I was designing something, you know, kind of to be famous or to be, you know, the one of the milestone stuff in the future. I was just doing designing and more or less it was my hobby actually you know it wasn't my job i wasn't assigned to do something i was told by jack to say hey yash do whatever you want you know kind of yes. stuff so i never worked in the company or <clears throat> excuse me or any other company with a time cards you know so i just show up whenever i want and you know, i left whenever i wanted type and i did not have any special duty i have to um do and just did whatever I wanted to do. So I was going to all the shows, trade shows, and I could buy any computer that I wanted to, to study and stuff like that. So it was, you know, I kind of liked it the way Jack put me <clears throat> to do those kind of things. So <clears throat> among what I was doing, I just kind of did design the computers which I thought was appropriate for that time and with a uh, all the wishes and hopes from the uh, jacks and the other marketing people. It would say, oh, I wanted this, I wanted that. I, you know, all the marketing people say, I want this, I want that. And our job of uh, engineer is to make that dream come true. So that's what I was doing. So I never had any intention of a thought about, you know, creating something great or anything like that. I was just, just enjoying what I was doing, so. Great. Um, yeah. What's your thought about this, that your, your computers were so successful that even um, there were clones of the Commodore 64, like the three, the three in Commodore 64 in Argentina, and <laughs> And there are also there were also black markets of uh, Cray imported Commodore 64 like in Peru and Russia. So what's mm. the thought about that? Well, you know, like like everything else, you know, if you are the entertainer, if somebody is going to imitate you, you know, you do something good. You know, and also like uh, every other stuff, if the cars or anything, if somebody wanted to kind of imitate your design or make a fake or copy out of it, you know, nobody wants to make a cheap, you know, the women's clothes or design or anything if it's not a famous and good. So I think, I think I'm proud of it and I'm honored if somebody, you know, tries to imitate or copy what I design is great, you know, so I don't mind. <laughs> Did you actually follow the development? I mean, the Commodore 64 um, has a lot of development. I mean, uh, not only the, the, the clones from Argentina, but also um, they were new or redesigned, re-engineered Commodore 64, like the Commodore 1, which is actually a multi-core, um, are uh, FPG client, if I'm not mistaken, where you mm. can where you can insert um, all kinds of um, cores by Jerry Ellsworth, all the all the very successful uh, 
direct to TV, a DTV joystick, the C sixty four a joystick. Did you follow that development? Yeah, I have seen it and I've heard of it, but I never acquired one and tried it or anything. But uh, you know, it, it's uh, it's a just natural course of development. If something is made, then it will be bound to be copied and improved. You know. So, like everything else, it gets smaller and better. Yeah, so it's just natural course. So, and I wasn't designing computers after that. I was designing more or less just discrete type uh, IOs and uh, some interfaces and some dedicated uh, the, the electronic uh, stuff. So, and actually, after the Commodore 64 and other stuff, I kind of lost the interest in designing computers because uh, wasn't much you can do because of the the design of a CPU and design of all the um, you know the chips like especially like Intel. You got North Bridge, South Bridge, and uh, CPU, and you cannot deviate too much, or you cannot be too much creative about your design because it's set already. It's like saying it's like plastic model. You're given this is what you do, then you make a computer. You know, it's not like a you are the part. Oh, you know, go go crazy and make your own. You know, you can't do that anymore. Then I lost my interest. Yeah, well, so actually <laughs> something. Yeah, back in the day, you you really did your own computer. You could design yourself what you want. Yeah, so you know, it was more or less it was for the hobbyists and uh, not to the a uh, just regular people. And it wasn't for their sense, it wasn't much of the you know user friendly. But uh, we when we designed Vic Twenty and uh, other computers, we tried to make it you know so simple, so you do not need much of the knowledge, actual knowledge of electronics or computers, to actually enjoy the computers. You know, even nowadays, you know, the, nobody buys a computer just because you are the computer engineer, because you are just anybody. So you can buy computers and you take it home and you can use it. And uh, it's more or less, it's not hardware, but software. There's a lot of softwares help the users to be, you know, expert of the way they use. So, uh, but uh, the old days, uh, only thing we had a basic, and it was very friendly. It wasn't no machine language or anything, so it was much easier than before. But still, if you want to enjoy, you want to enjoy programming, then you can feel like, oh, well, you know, I wrote some programs and now it works the way I want it, you know. So, so it was more of the toy for the. Um, engineering-minded people, so... Well, it was still a reason for many people to learn assembler that were casual <laughs> users because they thought basic was too slow for their needs, so... It was, yeah, so, yeah, it actually, the, I had to, you know, I was a hardware engineer, but uh, when I was doing it to make a uh, test program, so everything, I had to learn the uh, machine language, and I was coding it, and... Uh, the only language I learned in college was uh, like Fortran and the Kovo and all kind of you know the kind of the higher language. So you know, so uh, it, it was fun, you know, working at the very basic of the computer. So you can or you could do more of what you wanted to rather than just follow what it was designed for, you know. So nowadays, if you buy computers, if you buy softwares, you know, it's limited. That's what you do. You know, you cannot do too much. So um, that's why, actually, I hate to say this in uh, this recording, but I hate, like, Apple products because it's so limited. Because it was so restricted, you cannot do much because then they said, don't do this, don't do that, I won't let you do this, I won't let you do that. But other, you know, phones or other computers, still, there are a lot of rooms you can work the way you want it. So, like phones, of course, I had iPhones once before, and then, of course, I kind of jailbroke it the second days, and then, you know, I started to 
in a way I wanted to do, but then I found out Android was much easier and more fun to work with, so I kind of abandoned the Apple and now I'm back to the uh, you know non-Apple stuff uh -huh. again. Great. Um, so how would you how would you do a Suzuki for nowadays if you hadn't if you hadn't been faced by uh, cost reductions, which you mentioned earlier? What would you have changed? What would you have done different in the design of the computer? Well, it's very difficult to say because, I, like I was saying, it is uh, different from old days. Nowadays, users are just regular people and you know, younger people. And it's easier to deal with younger people but older people. But even the older people, if you go to companies, they said, "Hey, here, here's your desk, here's a caboose, you know, the 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 uh, your the the uh, place, and you just sit in the first thing you see is a computer terminal sitting there. Then they tell you, here's your password, and here's a user name. So start working. So you you have to know the certain knowledge of the computers, which is not much." Because uh, it, the programs do everything for you, not a you do something. All you do is a typing something in, and uh, they will tell you, do this, do that, put this one in, give me this, give me that. Then pretty much you are working for the computers, not using computer, you know, to work. You know, so uh, computer has to do a lot of stuff. It's not a just a say here I am you know tell me what to do type of stuff you know so pretty much they are telling you what to do so it's very hard to do a cost reduction because it does take a lot of stuff to do so so it's it's more of the a very expensive you know the uh, they can do all kind of machines so we can cut the cost down by cutting here there and everything then. It would be very hard for users to use the computers because they are so used to just follow the instructions. And if you notice now, they said, "Okay, press key and follow what the screen says." You know that's what it is nowadays. It's not something you you know initiate and you finish. You know it, it's you hit the key, rest of them done by the computers. So as far as the cost reduction you're talking about, the, the thing you can do is uh, by utilizing a same parts. You know, everybody come up with a modules. Here's a modules for this, modules for that. All you do is just put it together type stuff, like Raspberry. Okay. You know, if you do that Raspberry type concept and make it much bigger, and kind of a little bit higher level, then everybody can have a computer cheap enough and which is good enough not to pay for something you never use. You know, it's like cars. You buy a car now, and you, you what, what do you get? You get the GPS, and you get the heated seat, and you get the sunroofs, and you get the automatic this, automatic that, Bluetooth, and how much of that stuff do you use every day? It may be less than 10%, but you're paying for that. So if you kind of concise that to the bare minimum, what do you use every day, same thing as computers, then probably you can have a much cheaper computer. I think Raspberry is very nice for that sense, yeah. Well, a lot of people ask, uh, for example, why you decided against rubber keyboard, which other cheaper computers used at that time? Well, that was Jack's idea, well, as far as I know, you know, because Jack told me. Because Jack said, I want a computer, I don't want any toy. So he went for full-size keyboard, and he, he, Jack said, hey, you're in Japan, you should be able to make this cheap. And we did look for everywhere and tried to make it a a nice and uh, we found Mitsumi company and Mitsumi made a keyboard very cheap and good so and it was, it was right because he started as a typewriter you know manufacturer's company 
before you know, he started the calculator and in New York City. So he knew how important it was to have a good keyboard. Because if it's a typer that was made by rubber keyboard, I don't think it was you know easy to type. So he knew how important it was. So he said we do need a full size a keyboard, and uh, he was right. Like Sinclair and uh, IBM made the small computers with a membrane keyboard, and they failed because the keyboard was not a keyboard. It was a just a Memblem, yeah. So, in that sense, Jack had, uh, Jack was right and had the right idea. But if it was about um, being economic and um, user friendly, who came up with the idea of making such a bold case in the beginning of the first model and the big twenty two? So, um, you have you have a hard time you have a hard time typing compared to the newer model where you have flatter case. Yeah, that time he wanted to have a one-piece construction, you know, rather than having a two pieces. And because he wanted to be a portable. And uh, so we have to put everything in a case and we look at, say, what is the biggest one, you know, part of the computers, keyboard. Okay, let's start with keyboard case. Then uh, it, was, it was designed by Japanese uh, mechanical engineer, and we did that in Japan. And then uh, first we thought, hey, look, you know, this this is kind of ugly, you know. <laughs> then uh, this looks funny, and uh, but uh, to be a one piece and uh, portable, so we have to base everything and design around the computer, uh, the uh, keyboard. Actually, you know we. Then we try to fit that the PCB circuit board within that housing rather than you know design around the the PCB. So it was like a, the other way around design. Yeah. Well, there, there you can see the the difference of seven year, uh, six years from 1918, 1986 when the second version was released, which was a very flatter. So it was a problem that you you couldn't make it fit. You couldn't make it smaller. That was the reason why. Yeah, the yeah, because uh, like I was saying that uh, like nowadays everything is being smaller and more efficient. But old days we just didn't have enough technology or you know the ideas to make it smaller. So we we couldn't make that keyboard thinner and with a same kind of a touch and uh, actions. So we had to you know, use that keyboard, and uh, actually the the because of the engineer was holding keyboard every day, looking at it, try to design the case, you know, around that. So and then later it became smaller and thinner, and also we had a better parts, at, you know, components and the uh, ASICs and everything, so we could make the uh, circuit board smaller and everything also. But that time we just didn't have it. We wish we had, but we just didn't have it. Then, because we are so far ahead of time when we we're designing, the, everything else came later, you know. So. I see. Um, how was it working with the other guys? I think the SID chip was, for example, not not uh, designed in Japan, right? Um, so you had to work a lot with the people from Commodore USA and well you had to make the whole thing fit. And the interesting thing is that the Commodore 64 is the well told to be the first computer having a synthesizer chip rather than, than having a B plop chip that <laughs> only makes some funny noises. So how 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 did you work uh, with the other guys in that concept? Make yeah, the the six year sixty four uh, was uh, I started to do that in MOS technology. You know, when, after I moved to US, and uh, so MOS already had a uh, six five sixty, which was a big chip, and uh, the uh, what was their name? I, I forgot to, but the uh, SID chip, the numbers was I I don't remember, but um, the SID. 
um, the, the, uh, six, uh, let me think. Um, the sixty-five eighty-one. Sixty-five could eighty-one. Be. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many sixty-five slides. So <laughs> and Bob Yanis uh, was a guy who was working on a SID chip, and uh, and there was a synthesizer chip, and they were also making a big chip, which was a uh, GPU. And uh, we put those together, and since I was there, then I was right there at the MOS, so it was very easy to put everything together. And uh, because that the uh, Vic and both uh, GPU and those sound chips were made by the same people, so it was no problem at all to interface, you know, both of them together. It was much easier than the kind of use a TI chip when they had one, and which was very difficult to use. So, and uh, like I said, I was in the U.S., so it was much easier to work with everybody, and uh, we had so many people. So, it was very simple, and uh, very basic design, then we could just give it Japan and finish it up designing it, yeah. I see. Um, so, now let me ask you this pretty simple why is, why are the sloppy routines of the Commodore 64 so slow that you that actually caused a creation of floppy speeder uh, companies and uh, sections because it was so slow um, you, you could you could wait minutes for it to load. The what was that? So uh, the floppy the disk drive is pretty floppy slow. disk. Yeah. Well, that, that uh, part, I wasn't involved, so I'm not too sure you know, why it was, but uh, I think pretty much it was more or less they want to have their own design. And I think they, that portion, I think uh, uh, Bob Russell and all those people were responsible for making a stuff. And also we came up with that serial bus very special serial bus, which, very, which was very similar to the USB nowadays. And uh, that was very good. And, uh, but since we did have that, and we didn't have much of the uh, uh, versatility or flexibility to adapt to any other people's engineering. So, and also at that time we had so much problems with the uh, copying the disks and everything, the piracy and everything. So, and they did have some different schemes, this, that, and everything. So probably that why it was so slow. And uh, I, I know it was slow. It was uh, almost like a cassette, you know, type speed. So. Yeah. Um. So how was it for you back then to create? those computer in aspect of market. Did you follow the development of your your design? Um, did, did you follow the market? Did, were you aware that that um, your invitations actually got other people's jobs like coders in the game business and uh, composers which which are pretty famous nowadays? Because they started music on the C64, yeah. so you are responsible for a career of a lot of people that are in the game business nowadays. Yeah, well, I never thought about that. And like again, I said my job as an engineer was to kind of make everybody's dreams come true. And I think just a part of that, not only in marketing and sales and company people's dreams come true, but also the user's dreams come true. If I'm very honored that some you know, famous composers use the VIC or the C64 to compose the music, and because that 64 could you know, the, make that dream come true. So other than that, like, uh, I, I don't exactly follow or the consequences of, of what I did in design. And if there was room to improve, I was always looking for that. But other than that, I didn't pay too much attention to 
normally I don't pay attention to any compliment or anything. I always pay attention to the some people pitching about it, you know. <laughs> so because I have to you know, switch and change and improve, so I was looking for the improvement rather than just compliments. So. So, um, what's your opinion about this C uh, one hundred twenty eight? Um, I mean, I also, we also had the Dave Haney and um, Bill Hurd in the interview, and um, yeah. they had a very hard time to to make the C one hundred twenty eight ninety nine percent compatible with the C sixty four. Well, uh, I was. Uh, there part of the time when they started C128 and C256 actually. And the only reason they did that is because the pit was such a nice computer. And uh, because of the pit was uh, old style designing. And when we didn't have any luxury of using uh, dynamic RAM, DRAMs. So it was dedicated for the static RAMs, which limited a speed and uh, which limited a uh, the you know everything else so naturally they came up and said that if the C64 can do this with DRAM why can't we just mix with PET and A64 and make a bigger computer which was C128 and C256 it was very kind of natural course of the development but a it wasn't a complete new design. It was more like a adopted design from both sides. So, and one of them is a old design of the old style computers, and the other one is you know, they wanted to have a 64K, and but they wanted to be bigger than 64, so they want 128, which is two banks of 64. And uh, they have to address the 256 you know, K in the 128K, and which was not capable by 8-bit computers anyway. And they were based on 8-bit computers. Now it's a 16-bit computer, so it's different. So um, at, at that time, again, their idea was good, and their, you know, the designing and everything was limited by what was available at that time. So again, our ideas and, and concept was way ahead of what was available at that time for designing. So the Bill, uh, the Hart and the other people was working as much as they could, but they just couldn't get some part done because of the lack of uh, components and uh, technology. So the, you have to be, uh, you, they always say you have to be in the right time and the right place, and they were at the right place, but they were, it wasn't the right time because it was way ahead of time, so. I see. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you, what's your opinion about emulation? Because um, in 994, the whole emulation thing started, um, where, where people started, well, um, creating a C64 emulator and improving it, and nowadays most people, or many people at least, are using the Commodore 64 on a PC using white emulator, for example, rather than the original machine. And there are actually two user groups. One group that says, "I oh, know only the only the real hardware is the good thing, and all this emulation is evil, because it will never be a 100% playing like the real thing." What's your opinion about, about this? Well, the emulator or ICE or whatever you know you want to call the emulator, we do use a lot when we design something because we don't have any luxury of creating one dedicated chip, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to just test it out. So we use a other computer which is capable of emulating what we have in our heads, and uh, so in that same sense, using emulators. To emulate 64 is a very good idea, but uh, in a sense of you know, making something what you want, it's good. But if you want to have something in large amount, what you are emulating is not exactly what the 64 was. So 
that they cannot make a mistake by thinking, okay, what it works on the emulator will work on the 64. So it's the other way around. You know, what it works on the 64 will work on emulators, but not the other way. So as long as they understand that, they are more than welcome to just emulate the 64 any way they want it and add anything they want it and make a much better 64 compared to the, you know, delegated original 64. So I think it's a wonderful idea that people will be able to emulate and simulate a 64 on a like regular PC or any kind of, you know, the laptops or even on the tablet, I don't care, and enjoy the games and everything. And, uh, well, like Nintendo and other people don't like that idea because of the, you know, it, it is a, uh, like copying the, their games and playing on the, the other machines, but I understand that. But, but emulation is part of the, you know, ongoing process of developing any kind of a machine you have to emulate. So if you are doing that to kind of improve your working environment or, you know, whatever you are doing, it's good, but by just, uh, you know, doing that to bypass the original machine is not a good idea, you know. So I don't kind of promote that, but uh, as, as long as you know what you're doing and, uh, you know, the trying to improve what you have is good, but uh, bypassing is not. <laughs> mm. Okay. Um. Now, speaking about designing and, um, and emulation and, um, well, different models, actually the Commodore 64 had, had one issue that was there are, there are separated models for America and uh, Europe, so you have this 60 and 50 hertz issue that a lot of yeah. software would have to be fixed. And I think, I th yeah, in the, in the book On the Edge um, from Brian Bagnall, where he interviewed lots of the Commodore people. I think there was a place um, in the chapter where, where it said that this was actually to, to really divide the market to avoid that people would do cray imports and stuff. And uh, well, was this on purpose? Because it created a big problem about floppy routine, um, organization and music that would play too fast or too slow or something? Well, uh, one thing, uh, 60 hertz and 50 hertz on a normal household uh, AC systems, in Japan they have both in one country. In one small country in the northern part, they oh. have uh, 50 hertz and southern part 60 hertz. And, and that, actually that's not a problem in Japan. I don't think, you know, they kind of pretty well manage that, but the actual problem of the uh, 64 having the two different models is NTSC and PAL systems. It is not a, just because of 50 and 60. Of course, there's a problem with 50 and 60 because we use that as a kind of base, you know, but we did generate our own 60 hertz inside of the computers, but we have to have a different uh, frequencies to kind of bring it down from the higher frequencies to create a 60 hertz because we do use that as an interrupt to scan the keyboard and everything else. IRQ signals were developed from that 60 hertz, generated 60 hertz, not from the uh, AC, you know, the uh, house current. So the problem was not actually 50 or 60, it was a PAL and a NTSC systems because that both is, you know, 64 and 20, big 20, were designed to display on a normal TV. So it wasn't a dedicated, we, we did have a 1702 monitors, which was dedicated monitors, but nobody, you know, not, I should say nobody, not many people wanted to spend more money to just buy, you know, monitors to display 40 characters on, on you know, the uh, uh, TV. So we, the whole idea was to utilize a, a home TV for display and having a 40 characters and, uh, you know, 28, 30 characters. So, uh, 
it was very important to have a composite video signals coming out, actual video, normal TV signals. So we had to go with the PAL or NTSC, which was uh, scanning was 50 or 60 hertz difference. So it's not house kind problems, it was a video problem. That's what it was. Then since we could not convert it, we had to stick to what the, every country had, so PAL or NTSC. Then uh, we had a problem of, <laughs> you know, those are, that you mentioned uh, because of the 50 and 60 difference, and one is uh, playing a, you know, so many percent faster and some of them are slower. So, uh, but that was something we could solve by having a dedicated systems, but then people were forced by their own monitors, like nowadays, you know, so it was a, um, it was a kind of a the toss up between whether you want to have a nice cheap home computers or go back to all drawing board and say, okay, now you have to buy this, buy this, buy this to play with this computer, you know, so. I see, so that, that, so that was the reason. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so you are most known for the two computers you did. Um, what, what else did you do um, that you are less known for? I know, for example, that right now you are working together with Chuck Cattle and his company, and um, in his interview, he said you are actually working on uh, hard disk or SSD drive controllers and that stuff. At the oh, okay, yeah, yeah. The, uh, uh, yeah. I don't know how much I can, you know, the say this because of this uh, kind of ongoing project. And so, uh, as long as uh, Chuck mentioned, I think it's okay to say yes. Uh, he uh, also we had all the patent. Uh, filed already, so it's not a problem. But actually, Chuck Pedro, as everybody knows, he is the father of the 6502, and he's very smart person as far as a all the uh, computer kind of the tips and uh, all the, the you know the tricks and everything. And he came up with a very good idea of kind of beating Apple because you know. Probably he mentioned a lot about Apple too because he doesn't like Apple and we and like I don't like Apple and neither of us buy any Apple products so, you know and uh, so that that kind of kind of entices us to uh, develop new things anyway so he came up with a good idea of uh, making a kind of similar or better product than Apple's like time machine kind of stuff and also utilizing a, what it has been kind of tossed away or you know, refurbished um, you know, the memory chips and stuff. So we are trying to make a SSD which is better and faster and cheaper SSD which is much more affordable and which will be able to make a you know, regular PC to be very much compatible or even better than uh, Apple systems. So, and uh, I very much enjoy working with him. I'm not actually, you know, involved in actual designing of it. More or less, I am involved in doing things in Japan because you know we cannot uh, neglect Japan when we are doing something like that. So, the, in that part, I am involved, but. Uh, all the designing and everything is is done by Chuck, yeah. So you switch more from designing to consulting kind of thing nowadays? Yeah, like I said, I kind of lost the interest of designing and other than a very discreet type designing, which is very challenging rather than, you know, just time consuming stuff. So I do make my own computers, you know, now that I'm buying it off the uh, internet, I just buy the components and uh, create the way I want it, you know, and so I still do that, but it's not much of designing, you know, you, motherboard is made already, and I just buy a CPU, and just, you know, just be creative what, you know, what I want to you know, do, and everything is available, and uh, I'm satisfied with what I have, and uh, other than that, I 
do designing some toys and everything, you know, for my grandkids. <laughs> That's about it. And other than that, uh, I don't do much designing anymore and uh, consulting because uh, of my past knowledge of, like I said, you know, creating something from nothing and also, you know, making somebody's dreams come true. That concept is very important. So it, rather than actual hands-on stuff, I'm now trying to teach other people how you can be more creative, how you can create something from nothing, even though it looked impossible. You know, it, it's possible, you know, so it, I enjoy more by creating those kind of new monsters, you know, the kind of a, the engineer than actually I work on it because they have more you know, new knowledge than I do and they are more familiar with a later new technologies also. So I, I'm, you know, kind of ancient, you know, the type of <laughs> engineer. So what I can do is rather than teaching them a new technology, I want to teach them a original good philosophy of how the good engineer can be. Yeah. So are you, are you saying you are teaching others how to engineer too? Yeah, there's a lot more like consulting and you know teaching uh, the people. So it, it is like educating rather than uh, saying you know teaching. I should say educating or uh, trying to be the inspiration to other engineers of telling them what I did and how I did stuff. So if they can kind of come up with new ideas from what you know from my experience, then then I, I think that would be great because, like I said, nowadays everything is pretty, pretty much made already. So you know, everybody is saying, okay, I get this, I get this, and I can get that. But if you step back and look at it, the whole thing, there might be other ways making you know, the things, which might be a better way, uh, but you know, people do not see that every so often anymore. Like all this, that was the only way we could make something because that, that we have to be creative, but nowadays not many people are creative. They can create something, but they are not creative. So. <laughs> okay, interesting. Yeah, well, actually, what I found interesting is that a lot of uh, engineers and inventors and pioneers in that uh, old computer age, they are still working nowadays. Um, for example, last year I was talking to Wyatt Bear, who, in, who is one of the inventors of home video gaming, and he's 92, and he is still teaching elect electronic engineering like you, you said you do. So I wonder, um, you, you never quit, you never retire like, like other people. You, you, are, you are always up to something, and you always do something. Is that typical for a Commodorean to, to be restless and always be involved in, uh, in development of technology and the future? Well, the, I can't say too much about other engineers or other professions, but as far as I know, if I can call myself an engineer, uh, uh, engineer is somebody who is always want to create something from something or nothing and always thinking I said well this is not the best way of doing something there have got to be a better way of doing something and if there is something I we always look at this and okay we should be able to make this in a different way or you know you are not always satisfied with what it's there. You know, you always want it to do something different. Because you look at it and you understand it, then you kind of think, said, well, this is not it. It can be this way, it can be that way. It was more like a dream. And it was always, you know, I always look at somebody's new stuff. I said, it can be better. And it, why, why couldn't, couldn't he do this way? You know, why couldn't he or couldn't they do it that way? You know, kind of, uh, it's more like a kid. You know, it's always asking questions. 
Why? 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 You know, engineers are always why. Because you know, we never take anything for granted and or take anything as it is. We always said, why? Why did you do this? Why couldn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Kind of stuff. Then the people said, then if if you are me, what, what, what would you do? How, how, you know, how have you done it? You know, so we, we, we will start you know, creating or designing and we always want to do something. So I think many engineers, a lot of engineers like to cooking, to cook. Because you know, it, it's cooking is a very creative and hands-on stuff. You know, so like I like cooking, you know, I, I like to create something. I I don't always cook something nice, you know, sometimes I just cannot eat because it's so bad and stuff, you know, but same thing. So, uh, not only Commodoreans or the engineers in the Commodore, but uh, what I can say for Commodore engineers, uh, all engineers in Commodore, were very creative because it was such a nice environment where you could do anything you wanted. It's not like said, okay, this is what you do. You do this part. Okay, you do this part. And somebody put together and make something. We all together work and we talk and everything. And we, we couldn't do that left company already anyway. So what was left in the company were those people who you know had a dream you know, like the kids, you know, they, 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 we are always kids, you know, so we kind of like to be a kid. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, creating new yeah. world, like with a little Lego stone, but it's yeah, so, more. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, uh, you know, like playing with Play Doh all the time, you know, so you don't create the same thing over and over and over. If you see somebody create something, I say, well, I think I can do better than him, you know, type stuff. So, in the Commodore, it was like that, and the people worked together, and it was, uh, you know, good environment to kind of develop a nice engineers, yeah. So, now we got what you did for Commodore and what you do nowadays. What did you do in between after you left Commodore, and how was it working for other companies for you? <laughs> When you say well, that, that Commodore runs a career in so, such a nice environment, it must, it must be hard to keep up to, with that. So that's why after I left the Commodore, I never worked for you know, other companies. I always had my own companies. And after I left the Commodore, right after I left in Pennsylvania, I had my own company with other Commodore guys. And I was uh, in a consulting of the computers and computer business and systems and stuff. So I designed and maintained some of the computers of, of other company. The one uh, interesting company, I maintained uh, their computers and uh, changed. The, uh, I did work on software that also was a Uzi company, which is a you know the Israeli uh, military industry uh, gun company. Was in Pennsylvania, happened to be. And they had a old, uh, I think it was Honeywell computers, which had a lot of problems. So you had to maintain the computers because, uh, because being a, a firearm company, they had to keep a good records, but they had so much problems. So they were using a printout rather than using computers all the time. So I helped them out. And I did design for some of the system design for a few other companies. Then uh, I didn't like the East Coast very much, so I left the East Coast and moved back to uh, West Coast. And I don't like California too much, so I moved back to Oregon. And uh, I was working on the 3D systems with the, uh, all the counter guards also. And, uh, that time uh, I was uh, asked to kind of start a company and uh, do a development and sales of the Nintendo softwares. So this was the HAL lab in Japan, which was the first, I think, among the 10 uh, Nintendo licensees in Japan. 
and they wanted to uh, do something in the U.S. So, and one of the, or a few guys were working in the Hair Lab. Actually, one of the guy was a Iwata, which is a president of the uh, Nintendo now today, and he was a uh, kind of Commodore the groupie when I was in the Commodore in Tokyo, so he was coming to my office all the time, you know. So then I knew him and they said, well, if we want to do something in the U.S., we should ask Yash. And said, okay, fine, if you want me to do something, then I set up the company and uh, did some of the uh, the, uh, software stuff. And we did develop some softwares and we did some sales. But then the how didn't go too well in Japan, so we had to fold the company. Then after that, um, I was doing all the consulting as usual, and um, then I, I was asked by my wife, said, well, and I don't like the rain, so let's move to uh, somewhere else. I said, okay, fine, because Portland is very famous for the uh, rain. It rains about uh, 200 days a year or something. So. <laughs> So I said, where do you want to move? So he, she said, let's move to Hawaii. I said, okay, fine, let's move. And so I, we just took off and moved to Hawaii. Then Hawaii, I was, I've been doing a consulting also, and I did consulting for a lot of uh, Japanese company. And um, I did talk to the Atari company, which is Jack's company, but I you know I didn't want to work in California, so I never worked with Jack again. But he did ask me to do something with uh, Jaguar game machines and everything. He wanted me to take it to Japan and start a Japanese uh, company over there. But uh, I said, no, I don't want to do that. (laughs) So, but since then, I am living in Hawaii and still consulting for Japanese company and uh, other companies in uh, biotechnology and some of the chemical companies and... uh, uh, stuff not much with the uh, true means of computer companies anymore. So, so how did you start working with uh, with Chuck Hedl again? Well, there, there was a uh, it was funny because my daughter is still in Pennsylvania, and uh, you know she is still going to school in the University of Pennsylvania, trying to get higher degrees and stuff. So. Um, then how did it work on single of it? Then um, Bill Hurd sent me an email one day. He said, is this Yash Terakura used to work in the Commodore in Pennsylvania? And I said, yeah, who are you? And he said, Bill Hurd. Yes, I, I remember you. Then we started conversations and you know, then she, you know, he was still in Pennsylvania. And also the uh, the Don Gilbert uh, was still there, so I said, yeah. And my daughter is still in Pennsylvania, and I was coming back to Pennsylvania, so let's meet. Then uh, we met again after uh, I don't know. It was I left in '85, so uh, after more than 20 years, we met again, and we talked, 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 talk, and then uh, he was uh, communicating with Chuck a lot. And he, he, amazingly, he kept it in touch with everybody in the Commodore, and uh, also like yourself and with all the Commodore in studios. So, and he told me to, oh, why don't you, you know, do this, do that, and talk to this guy, talk to that guy and stuff. So I said, oh yeah, okay, and. Uh, and I, I said, why don't you give me the um, email of the uh, Chuck? So. And uh, he gave me an uh, email. So I sent the email to Chuck and said, Hey, Chuck, uh, this is Yash. You remember me? And he said, Yeah, I remember you, you know, very well. So what are you doing? And that's all started. And uh, we talked. And then uh, since my daughter, another daughter, was in Sacramento, California. And he was in Santa Clara, California. Uh, Santa, not Santa Clara, Santa Cruz. So I said, let's meet. And one day we met, at the, and on the way he was going to Reno, he stopped at Sacramento because he, he goes through. So we sat and we talked, and then um, and we kind of you know, 
rekindle our old relationship and uh, we talk 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 and then uh, next thing he said uh, guess what I'm doing nowadays and uh, I said oh, let me know and he told me and what he was doing and said are you interested yeah, I said sure I'm always interested in you know the new technology and stuff and said okay you want to help me out sure why not you know so that's how we started and like uh, just like in uh, old days we just you know, there was no gap between, you know, between old days and new days. There wasn't any uh, gap for 20-some 20, 20 years. You know, we just, like old days, we just talked and uh, started work and um, and hopefully we work uh, a long, long time. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, well, I, what I heard a lot from you guys is that um, Commodore was a whole big family, something like that. Yeah, it was a, uh, like I said, you know, it was pretty much the group of kind of particular type engineers. And like I said, if they didn't fit, they left. So what was left you know, was like Chuck, me, and Bill, you know, like all those kind of weird engineers kind of people, you know. So in a sense, it wasn't a normal, you know, like, you know, the big company engineers. It was more, more or less. It was like a bunch of uh, kids, hobby kind of, you know, very happy engineers. And good thing that Commodore did. Normally, the big company, like like Google now, you know, it's it's like a very free, you know, atmosphere. A good company, and if you don't fit, and uh, if you're just there doing nothing and just play around, you know, you don't go anywhere. But if you're good enough, then they will let you do what you want to do, kind of company. So, so like, like again, I said, who are left in Commodore's were well, all those people. Mm. So, like, if you don't feel like family, they left. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, uh, when, we, when we spoke before this interview, you told me that there was, um, was that that there's a lot of information out there that is not so much true between the marketing guys and the engineers because yeah, uh, well, the <laughs> engineers would, would do a lot of things more colorful than it actually was. So what, what are those things that you think were spread um, incorrectly as information out there? Well, the, uh, there are a lot of uh, things you know, told by you know it was designed and uh, dedicated and this that by the marketing and this I think it's part of them are true because they always had the meetings and we engineer were never invited in those meetings so we don't know what inspired what happened during that you know meetings at all so uh, I had mentioned particular names like Tom Check I never met him during the course of developing the VIC-20. I built him after we started to sell VIC-1001 in Japan. So, you know, I didn't know whether, you know, he was part of this, part of that, or anything. But, you know, the, uh, a lot of things probably, what we said was convey to those marketing people and they had a meetings, discussions, and everything when it came back from the Jack, so I thought it was Jack's idea, or it could be, you know, came back from Chuck Pedal, so I thought it was Chuck's idea, and, you know, all those stuff, so, like, you know, I don't deny or approve anything, you know, or endorse anything what has been said or what has been, you know, the told. The only thing I know is that, uh, uh, it was a very short period of time that VIC-20 was developed. Because when it, I, I, like again, I would say, I didn't know if it was Jack's idea or what, but Jack said, let's make this computer in Japan and sell in Japan. And I was called and I was told and I did. That's all I know, you know. So in a nitty gritty, you know, those small, you know, the portion of it, uh, no details, I don't know, but like everybody wanted the credit, but you know, I just hate be in a public 
so I don't say too much, so I just can sit back and watch and say, okay, fine, you know, so I, I made a computer, so it was so fine, that, that was it. So I, I, you know, I, I don't care who said what, but, you know, then Chuck was very concerned about it. I, he always said, hey, Josh, you, know, you, you didn't get enough grades. I said, fine, I don't care, you know. <laughs> so, but, you know, one thing I can say is I did enjoy, and I am kind of proud of what I did when I was with Commodore, so. Yeah, that's actually yeah. one thing to mention. Compared to the other people that work at Commodore, you are more like in the shadows. Like uh, <laughs> a lot of people don't know that you are involved in this business before so much, that you are really uh, one of the well key people of the business before responsible for its design. Um, for example, when I looked for information from you, I just found um, an, uh, a little article in the Swedish Wikipedia version. So. <laughs> Why is that? That you are so much in the shadows and uh, not so much uh, in, in touch with the community. Well, I part of them is that I think it's my character. You know, I not the kind of person just want to you know just stand up on the podium and uh, you know with a uh, you know fanfare and everything and said, hey, here I am. Look at me. I I did this. I did that. That was me kind of stuff. And even though I was attending every single CES, and uh, that was my job to take Arvin Good around and uh, explain to him what's the new technology and what the other people were doing and everything. And uh, my job was to kind of, you know, be informed with the new technology and what other people were doing. And I was too busy doing so. And, uh, you know, I wasn't... Uh, uh, too crazy about you know the in front of everybody explaining what we were doing as a Commodore. So I, I figured that was somebody else's job. So you know, all other people, you know, went up and they, they, even during the show they explained what it was. I I was you know even care about you know trying to explain what the big twenty was and how it was you know it was born and stuff. So I kind of gave everything to other people and. Um, even in Japan, I was uh, told to be you know, interviewed a lot of times by all the media because you know, they figured, you know, I was the one because at, I was the only one could speak, uh, you know, Japanese at that time in Japan as an engineer, and knowing enough to tell about the Big Twenty, Big One Thousand One in Japan. So, but you know, I just uh, I don't know. I just hate to you know kind <laughs> of. Like your interview is fine because it was very, you know, for the dedicated people in the small groups and who understand very well. But I just don't like any general publics, you know. So I, I, I try not to, you know, there, most of the time what it happens if you are out there trying to do something, you know, not everybody can understand you 100%. You know, only few of them can understand as me as an engineer and was what I am. And most of the people will misunderstand. And that will spread the words. And uh, you know, sooner or later, you know, I, I'm i totally a different person. You know, so that, that, that's in, for that sense, I just said, okay, yeah, you know, you can say anything about me. And because I didn't say that, <laughs> but if I say something in a public place, he said that, even though I didn't say that, you know. So I, I'm not trying to be protective or anything like that, but I just kind of hate to uh, be out in the public and uh, under the spotlight. You know, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, <I'm... laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well. So you, you mentioned the CES shows. Maybe you could tell us a bit about how it was back then, because in, in the Commodore history book, um, it's mostly described like you had a you had a you had a bunch of machines on the CES shows that were prototypes that didn't work and were designed just for a specific type of tool and program to run, and people would. Um, well, the other marketing guys, nothing would present the system, and you would run around with a plastic tool, and well, it fixed the computers while they were running, though they don't get broken. 
So it was described as being um, very, very stressful. Um, well, the yeah, the CES uh, is a big show and very important show for everybody. And uh, at that time, it was very important show for Apple, Atari, and other people. Now they have E3 and all other shows, but we didn't. And uh, it was a total show for all the electronics, in, you know, from the uh, calculator, uh, the electronic watch, to the uh, TV, and you know, the, the all other uh, machine. A professional machine, dedicated machine, was uh, there had a different uh, show, but you know, overall consumer electronics. And uh, that was that was it. And uh, uh, if you're not there, and if you don't keep the same size or bigger booth, the following year, people will think, oh, that company is not doing well. You know, so you have to be there to show everybody we are still here and we are good. You know, so uh, to do so, you have to be better than everybody else. You have to be fancier than everybody else. You know, it, it, it's like a uh, movie or something. You know. So it was more like performance show. So we had to bring in everything, and we had to show everything possible, even though it was fake, you know, in that in a, in a sense. So I have seen so many companies showing some prototypes, which shows a mock-ups, and actual machine was emulated by big computers in behind, you know, because I can see all the cables running around to the back of the you know the uh, the stands and everything. So. But we did almost the same thing. We, we were not just you know showing the actual machine. We were showing some of the prototypes and everything. And we were uh, we made a dedicated programs and dedicated machine. And there were so many people and so many hours been running constantly and heat and everything. And uh, all those all days uh, heat was a big problem for the any solid state you know machine and. In, in Vic 20 or Vic 64 was not exceptions, and we had a big, big problem with heat. So uh, you run so many, many hours, then they go bad, and then, so we know only thing we could do is just swap it. You know, we didn't have a time. So if we showed 20 machines, we have to take about 40 or 60 machines every time. Then I was in the back trying to fix the machine. We actually did have a service corner with uh, soldering irons and a scopes and everything and, and it was fixing machines. So, you know, then the marketing guys, you know, it, that, that was their, you know, thing. So they, they wanted to show the best of it and said, hey, yes, that was problem. Fix it. Okay, fine. Took it. Fix it. <laughs> you know, it was very busy and I, I didn't have much chance of being out there and you know, mingling with the, the uh, people or anything. I was mostly checking other people and also fixing computers. <laughs> so we always took a few engineers to fix the you know, machine. And we did stay late, but we, you can't stay too long because after they close the show, you have to leave the uh, show site, you know. So we have to fix it during the um, show. So like uh, uh, Las Vegas and uh, Chicago and all those big show site cities, I know every Radio Shack stores at that in locations. I know exactly where they are and what time they open their clothes. <laughs> because I had to run down there and buy the parts. <laughs> so it was very stressful for you. Um, yeah, it was fun, you know, but you know, it was part of the fun. <laughs> yeah, you, you mentioned the heat and um, one thing that is also mentioned is that the Commodore 64 had one big problem, the first um, power supply that they yeah. would get so hot that yeah. we even had cases of reported, um, yet yeah, even had cases of fire be, uh, being reported because yes. of a burning curtain because of the yes. power supply. How did yes. that happen? I mean, I mean, um, didn't well, you think yeah. you said you designed it to, to hook up a television? Did you, didn't yeah. you think about, well, curtains and living rooms and, and such things? Yeah, uh, yes we did, uh, but you know, you just mentioned a Vic 20 and 64 problem, but let's step back. Like uh, when we started iPhone, how many instant did you hear? Said iPhone caught a fire, iPhone exploded, the Galaxy S3 exploded, and this and that happens. 
you know, then, then how many recalls you had on the uh, GM cars, Toyotas, Hondas, you know, it, it happens. And uh, we did design and some of them are not uh, up to par because of the designing and because of the cost reduction and everything, we were, we didn't have much of the luxury of having a safety margin, big, big safety margins. And we tried to make it a compact and everything. So we knew we had a you know, heat problems, but we figured hey, no one's going to use this computer for more than two hours or one hour, you know, because people do get tired of it. But actually we are totally wrong and people were playing with that all day long, you know. So some of them did, you know, heat it up quite a bit. And uh, even nowadays, you know, you have seen so many, you know, the incident with the household vacuum cleaners, you know, the uh, microwave ovens, you know, the TV, even TVs. So it is a, a kind of one of those uh, unfortunate things go along with a, any kind of electronic you know, equipment or any, any kind of equipment uh, is bound to fail. So it's uh, one, yeah, one of Murphy's law, you know, if it, you know, it bounce fail, it will fail. <laughs> So there weren't so much cases like reported in, in the history. Yeah, yeah. so if, if nobody says, okay, this machine runs 20,000 hours without incident. If the one machine catches fire, that, that's a news. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know, if everything goes normal, that's not news. So it's one of those things. So if you hear one thing, everybody just jumps up and down and says, wow, wow, look at it. Commodore has a fire. And the every Commodore, watch out. You know, you're going to get a fire, this, that. So it, it's one of those media stuff. So, you know, I, it, it was very unfortunate, you know, the incident. And um, I admit there was some problems with heat. So it, in an extreme case, it did catch some fire, yeah. But you did you did you did redesign the power supply. We, we yes we did we did redesign uh, upgrade the uh, power design with more safety margins and also we did a a lot of uh, the power reductions on the uh, PCB and the circuit board. We used some of the different type of uh, power supply uh, chips and stuff. Yeah. Uh, we always uh, improve, and at the same time we are improving, same time we are cost reducing. And uh, cost, of re cost reductions, we make sure the safety is still there and heat, you know, the stuff. And also the, uh, uh, some, some of the, uh, the components, we always switch to be a better component. And uh, we always find something better, yeah. So, um, despite company in 85. Were you involved with the second redesign of the 354 that was released in 86? Uh, a lot of uh, redesign was done and uh, some of them people did not notice because it was very such a minor, you know, the versions, new versions. And uh, like I said, you always find the better components, newer components, cheaper components. So they did design, redesign, and that time I think it was uh, Commodore Japan, they had newer engineers, and all those engineers left in the Commodore. Did, I think Commodore went down, it was like 1990 uh, something, so. 1994, yeah. 94 something, so about the nine years of my absence, you know, they you know, did uh, redesign quite a bit, yeah. Um, now, uh, one of my last questions about this um, um, NTSC thing is there is actually a very early version of the 64 NTSC, um, like an old NTSC version, a new NTSC version. And I think the difference is the, the, the different type of lines on the screen, if, if I remember correctly. Why, why, did, you, why did you release? Uh, um, a second version of the NTC 54. Oh, what do you mean by different lines on the screen? Um, I think I think um, you, you know the 
difference between Paul and is a number of lines on screen. Yes, yeah, scan lines, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And, um, and the older version of the business for entity well, has a different number of scan lines. Actually, uh, the very beginning of the uh, VIC chip, or 6560 chip, which is 6560 and 6561 was a parallel, I believe. And 6560 chips, and uh, when I was in MOS technology, uh, the engineers and we talked and we did the uh, check and we had problems with a color generations and phase problems within chips. Okay. So actually it was not reproducing the exact colors we wanted and uh, emulation or uh, reproduction of the uh, color signals within chip had a problem. So they did redesign the actual VIC chip. So at that time, I think they did change some of the uh, uh, scanning method of uh, interesting and non-interesting method inside. And uh, because of the uh, so many things are going on between a vertical retrace, you know, the time. So we did uh, change quite a bit on chip. So there, it was a, not a design change of the board, but mo more or less it was a design change of the chip itself. Um, so that would be all my questions for now. Is Wait. there any question <laughs> you think I missed? I should have asked you. No, the uh, like I said, the, the Commodore Japan, as well as like myself, wasn't much of the focus. When you know people talk about uh, Vic 20 or uh, you know C64, and not many people even know that uh, Vic 20 or Vic 1001 was you know, designed in Japan and sold in Japan way before it was sold in the US. And so, you know, and since the Japan was gone for a long time also, and it's very nice to you know, see some people are still interested in to know what happened. Oh, by the way, the big Tokai, which we consider the kind of key person in the Commodore Japan uh, passed away uh, last um, last May, I believe, yeah. 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 So, yeah. So we three do not, and Jack is gone, and uh, we three do not have anybody who started the Commodore anymore, you know. So, uh, so yeah, I'm glad that, uh, like yourself and all your, you know, the fans and the people still remember Commodore and uh, the, the try to learn and know more about uh, what we did. And truly, I believe we, like Bill Gates and, uh, you know, Steve and uh, Steve Jobs and uh, Jack Pedro and, like, we did start it, this computer age, you know, so, and I think everybody is proud of it and, uh, you know, great to be with that age, you know, so. <laughs> So let me ask you about your opinion of, um, of history, because I think, at least I have the feeling, before Prime Beckwell released his On the Edge uh, book about Commodore and the history and the rise of fall of Commodore, um, a lot of people were told in universities and so on, and even in the media and so on, they said that Apple, that Apple did the first home computers and stuff. All the credit went to Apple, and very little credit at that time, before 2006, went to Commodore. What's your opinion about that? Uh, I think that was one of the frustrations of Jack also. Because Jack wanted to be the number one, actually he was number one in a computer. You know, with the uh, Vic 20 and also the PET. And actually PET was the first computers, you know, the, as home computers which was uh, developed by Chuck Pedro and all those people. And uh, biggest frustrations I think Chuck and Jack had is that they were, I mean Apple, was using 6502, which was our CPU, <laughs> you know. So, and they were, you know, they got all the credits and more, they got more famous than you know, original 6502 uh, creators and owners. 
So I, I think that was the biggest frustration they had. And also, uh, uh, Jack was more of the you know, sales and market oriented people. And uh, uh, he did a lot of uh, you know, media hype and everything, but still, uh, he went too much for the marketing side of trying to sell and trying to say the computer is as a cheap, affordable computer rather than saying the best performance computers. You know, so, but Apple went the other way and said, okay, look, our computer is better perform. You know, it's better performance regardless of the cost or anything. You know, so uh, you know, for that sense, like all these, all the geeks and all those people went for the computers, wanted to have computers, not a cheap computers, but better computers, well performed computers. So for that sense, I think people went for the Apple and wanted to know more about Apple. And also Apple always said, okay, you can have this, but you cannot have this, you cannot have that. So, so restrictive. So it, 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 it's like everything else. If you can't have it, you want to have it more, right? So I think for that sense, everybody went for Apple, wanted to know more about Apple. And you want to get you know, more of the Apple than anything else. But the Commodore was such an easy, affordable, easily available, readily you know, available product. So it was like a, 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 something, it's there all the time. So people did not pay much attention to it. I think that, that was part of it. So, and it, later, uh, Commodore did announce this, that, and everything, but it was always saying, this is the home computers which you can afford. You know, they always say that as a price. You know, they're not a performance. So. So you are kind of happy that nowadays the history is rewritten, kind of, and um, corrected. So now the you Commodoreans get the credit you deserve for what you did to the nowadays computer usage. Yeah, I, I think you know, I'm glad people finally realized, you know, what you know we did as a Commodore. It helped a lot for what we have nowadays and you know computer age we have, and we did a big part of it. And uh, I, I, I'm glad. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for well for allowing us to interview you and to share your story and your knowledge. So finally, we could close some um, knowledge gaps about Japan and the development. Great. I yeah, I'm glad I could shed some uh, lights into the uh, all the Commodore days. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I wish you good luck with your plans with Chuck. With, with Chuck. Um, on your well current development and your teaching and consulting. So I will say uh, have a nice day and thank you. Uh, Bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye.